Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. This is episode number 773. My name is Camden Busey. I'm in Libertyville, Illinois, the Reformed Forum headquarters. Happy to be back with you today for another episode. We're going to be bringing to you the third installment from our recent theology conference, uh, this one from Danny Olinger. Our conference theme was The Covenantal Tale of Creation, Christ, and Consummation, The Life and Work of Meredith G. Klein. Uh, We've already uh, released um, lectures by John Meather and Scott Wright, and today we're going to get to Danny's in a minute. But i got a few things to mention. Uh, As I record, it's uh, Thursday, October 20th. 2022. I just got back uh, from a two-day conference in Wheaton. Uh, I went down to Harbor House at Wheaton College uh, for the Presbyterian Scholars Conference, which is organized by Jeff McDonald. And uh, extremely thankful for the invitation and being able to go down there and, and hang out with a bunch of Presbyterian historians, particularly, and to hear fascinating lectures all sorts of interesting panel discussions and uh, had a lot of conversations over meals with a wide variety of people. Uh, Real heavy hitters there, really thoughtful folks. But um, although it is in some ways an academic conference of the highest order with some of the biggest and most uh, currently influential Presbyterian scholars that are out there, uh, at the same time, it's very accessible and uh, the group is tremendously friendly and collegial and you don't end up because of, of its scale and perhaps even because of its location and its size, where it is and how it's organized. It uh, doesn't have uh, some of the uh, stuffiness or maybe the um, performative aspects that you that you might find at some of the larger academic conferences. So I find it to be a true, true uh, pleasure to be there and hopefully we can put on some of our own little conferences like that not only in person but uh, online here at Reform Forum and we're looking to do that. I want to just highlight a few things and perhaps uh, introduce a few topics and get a few books and whatnot on people's radar uh, on on their radars so that we might uh, you know prepare them for future episodes. I don't have anything scheduled but I have ideas and I've had a bunch of conversations with folks so I would like to put on your plate if you would, uh, first off, uh, the book Reformed and Evangelical Across Four Centuries. It's uh, the Presbyterian story in America. It's published by Erdman's. There was a panel discussion on this book at the conference, and uh, it was interesting. I'll put it that way. It got kind of heated in a couple points, uh, and there were some different interpretations or some thoughts about how the book might be augmented. Uh, two of the authors were there uh, to to speak on behalf of the book and share their ideas. They were Kenneth J. Stewart and uh, Donald Fortson. Uh, Ken Stewart is a emeritus from Covenant College, and uh, Don Fortson is at RTS Charlotte. Uh, but the other two authors are Nathan Feldmuth and Garth Rosell. So these four scholars represent four of uh, the four largest, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Presbyterian bodies in America. Uh, the PCUSA, the ECO or the Eco Church, the EPC and the PCA, not necessarily in order. Uh, but uh, this is a, a tremendous book, a uh, sizable book. They originally intended it to be three volumes, but the publisher wasn't so interested in that. So take a look at this. There are many chapters on different issues in American Presbyterianism. Certainly something you want to read and give your attention to. So hopefully we can address some of, not if, if not the entire book, at least some of the chapters down the road. Get a copy of that from Erdman's. Also, America's Book. You've heard of America's God? Do you have America's Book? Uh, This is a a new book, relatively new, written by Mark Knoll, who was at the conference also speaking and uh, being the object or the subject of study. This book was the focus of a panel discussion, and four different people were able to comment on the book, offer their thoughts, and then Dr. Knoll responded to all those thoughts. But uh, America's book is enormous. It's huge. As Daryl Hart said on Twitter, I believe, it could stop two doors. Uh, the subtitle to this is The Rise and Decline of a Bible Civilization, 1794 to 1911. Uh, and this is published by Oxford University Press. Surely will be, no doubt already is, I imagine, in many ways, a classic and uh, definitely something that all American historians, Presbyterian and religious historians ought to be reading, and uh, certainly a a significant volume. And there was some fascinating and thorough discussion on that book there. America's Book by Mark Knoll, Oxford University Press. Finally, I would like for you to know and to hear about an article that was written by Jeffrey S. McDonald, the organizer of this conference, 
Uh, and um, this article is available, free access, free and open access online. I'll put a link to it in the episode description. But it's titled, Advancing the Evangelical Mind, Melvin Grove Kyle, J. Gresson Machen, and the League of Evangelical Students. So this is a really interesting uh, piece, and uh, I hope that people can take a look at it. If you get a hold of it, maybe we'll be able to do an interview with Jeff on the subject down the road. So now that I've said that publicly, I guess I'm twisting his arm, but we'll see what we can do. Let me read you the uh, the uh, abstract. Uh, this article seeks to analyze Melvin Grove Kyle and the growth of the League of Evangelical Students founded by Jir Gresson Machen and Princeton Seminary students in 1925. Both Kyle and Machen were scholarly leaders in the LES and served on the organization's board together. This paper will establish the importance of Melvin Grove Kyle as a leading evangelical scholar and bibli- biblical archaeologist. It will also explain the origins and growth of the LES and how various Presbyterians influenced the organization and sought to advance a broader evangelical Protestant intellectual life in the difficult period of the 1920s and 1930s. Machen's role will be highlighted, and the thinking of various evangelical scholars associated with the LES will be analyzed. This study is important because it helps us grasp how evangelical Protestantism rehabilitated and advanced itself intellectually in a period when the movement faced educational marginalization in the wider culture. So you can find this at MDPI. Uh, It's an open access journal. You can download a PDF of it for free and read. So tremendous, very useful helpful here uh, in this in this uh, day and age. We'll learn much to, to, to read and study that. So I'll have a link to that in the episode description as well. well let's get back to our conference. Uh, again, um, just at the beginning of October, we hosted our conference here at Hope OPC in Grays Lake, Illinois. The Covenantal Tale of Creation, Christ, and Consummation, The Life and Work of M.G. Klein. All the episodes or the, um, the lectures, the main sessions are available and a combined playlist on YouTube already, but we are putting them out into the feed in this venue, and we will do so, Lord willing, next week as well with Lane Tipton's address. And then we're back to our regularly scheduled conversations and interviews with authors. We have a Van Til group scheduled on the calendar, so I'll be recording that next week. So in two weeks, not the next episode, but the episode after that ought to be a Van Til group. And then hopefully a whole string of really interesting conversations with different theologians and uh, historians coming up. In this third address... Danny Olinger spoke on the biblical theology of Voss Klein Gaffin, Meredith G. Klein and the Book of Revelation, Christ and His Spirit-Filled Church and Missions. We hope you enjoy. I'll catch you on the other side. A few years ago, I, I found myself reading Meredith Klein's paper, The Structure of the Book of Revelation. The copy I had was full of grammatical errors, um, as poorly typed as any paper I'd ever read. But theologically, uh, it was utterly compelling. It was like reading the best of Reformed biblical theology, being drawn into the text of Scripture, and seeing the centrality of Jesus Christ for the life of the church. I was totally taken with the paper. But I wondered if others felt the same way. So I asked Richard Gaffin about it. He told me that he was not only aware of Klein's paper, but that more than anything else, that paper determined how he looked at the book of Revelation as a whole. But it turns out that I was not the only one that Gaffin told this to. He actually told Klein in a 1973 letter. Gaffin wrote, Last spring, several students made me aware of your paper's existence, and I made a copy for myself, but was not able to get to it immediately. I want you to know that I ended up spending an entire day on it in what turned out to be the most stimulating and worthwhile study time of the entire summer. Great. I will admit that Revelation is not the center of the New Testament in which I feel most at home, but I know enough to recognize an unusually clear and incisive treatment of a difficult question. Really, I think it's just outstanding, and you can see that my enthusiasm continues unabated. I suppose I am wondering why you have never published it and challenging you to consider doing so. Until you do so, I'll have to plagiarize it unreservedly. Now, admittedly, in the years that followed that letter, 
there were times when Gaffin and Klein didn't get along so well theologically. But Klein always recognized that he shared with Gaffin a common biblical theological understanding of Scripture. In the mid to late 70s, Klein and Gaffin were writing back and forth to each other on a number of topics, including their respective views of the Sabbath. At one point, Klein said to Gaffin, quote, but the fact that even you and I, for all our agreement in biblical theological outlook, do not see eye to eye on this subject does show how important it is for the peace of the church that no particular view of the Sabbath be made a test of orthodoxy. In another letter, Klein tells Gaffin that he is his, quote, es eschatological comrade. Even after the turbulent 1980s, Klein spoke in a 1991 letter to a soon-to-be RTS professor of, quote, the biblical theology of Klein, of Foss, Klein, Gaffin. Now, the reason that Klein could say this, the reason why he believed that there was such a thing as the biblical theology of Foss, Klein, Gaffin, hyphenated, of course, was because of the shared conviction that eschatology precedes soteriology, that pre-redemptive revelation precedes redemptive revelation. Gavin spent a lifetime exegetically working out this insight from Boss's Pauline eschatology. Klein spent a lifetime exegetically working out this insight from Boss's biblical theology. Gaffin's emphasis upon 1 Corinthians 15 and what it meant to Paul that eschatology precedes soteriology can be seen in Gaffin's great resurrection and redemption. Klein's emphasis upon Genesis 1 through 3 and what it meant at creation that eschatology precedes soteriology can be seen in Klein's profound kingdom prologue. Gaffin and Klein both confessed repeatedly that they were Bossians in this regard, which is why I believe Klein could speak about the biblical theology of Boss, Klein, Gaffin. But their biblical theological agreement didn't stop there. Over against Roman Catholicism, they agreed that the Reformed faith had rightly understood creation, image of God, and covenant. They agreed that Jesus Christ, the second Adam, accomplished that which the first Adam failed to do in the covenant of works. They agreed that in the covenant of grace, believers through faith in Christ come into the realization of the heavenly goal set before Adam, spirit-filled communion with God on a higher estate without end. But I believe there's another distinguishing mark that, that uh, is included in that paradigm of the Foss, Klein, Gaffin, Reformed Biblical Theology. And it is their shared commitment to what Foss called the deepest principle of the Reformed faith when it came to the interpretation of Scripture, uh, namely the preeminence of God's glory in the consideration of all things. In 1997, Klein had just finished the last of his Zachariah articles and was turning to his next writing project. He told his former student and friend Bill Hobbs, quote, I'm trying to write a book on eschatology that will convey the pattern of the covenants. Tentative title, God, Heaven, and Armageddon. Five years later, he elaborated on the progress he was making on the book and the methodology that he was employing in a letter to Michael Horton. This is what he wrote Horton. One thing that I maintain in God, Heaven, and Armageddon, as in previous writings, is the priority of revelation. In particular, revelation as the self-identification of God's glory to redemption. Considerations in favor of this include, first, the teleological ultimacy of the meaningfulness of God's glory, and second, the chronological priority of pre-redemptive, non-redemptive revelation to redemption. Friends, 
Those are the priorities of a Faustian reformed biblical theology. Klein, in explaining what he is doing in God, Heaven, and Armageddon, expresses the commitment to the same thing that Foss emphasized, and for that matter, uh, Gaffin also. The preeminence of God's glory and the priority of pre-redemptive revelation to redemptive revelation, and that when teaching about eschatology and the covenants. But if that wasn't enough, Klein continued in his letter to Horton. He said next, similarly, I regard the creational indoxation of the Spirit as having priority over the redemptive incarnation of the Son. In other words, Genesis 1-2 precedes Genesis 3-15. The Spirit moving over the chaotic deep brings order and life prior to the fall into sin in the promise of the coming Messiah. Klein continued in the letter. He said next, Likewise, I see redemption as subservient to creational sabbatical eschatology. Again, in plain terms, Genesis 2, 1 through 4, precedes Genesis 3, 15. The eternal God, the eternal Sabbath, God arriving at the seventh day of completion, precedes the fall into sin and the promise of the coming Messiah. Now, it's in Kingdom Prologue that Klein provides an exegetical foundation and explains the significance of the indoxation of the Spirit and the eternal Sabbath. But he also does so in Images of the Spirit, which is the book that shows that Klein also comprehended and mastered Boss's Pauline eschatology. For Boss and Klein, pneumatology is eschatology. The age to come is the age of the spirit. But there's a subtle difference between Boss's Pauline eschatology and Klein's images of the spirit. Boss follows the theme of eschatology in the spirit from its Old Testament roots in Genesis to Paul's epistles. Klein follows the theme of eschatology in the spirit from Genesis through the prophets through Paul to the apocalypse. He's always ending up in the book of Revelation. At least that's his own confession from the preface to Images of the Spirit, where he writes over and over again in the following chapters, usually at a climax point, attention turns to the book of Revelation. What is true of Images of the Spirit is true of Klein's biblical theological writings as a whole. He keeps coming back to the apocalypse because it is the capstone of biblical revelation where Christ and the gift of the Spirit intersect with the fulfillment of the eschatological hope of mankind made in the image of God. That's my thesis concerning Meredith Klein in the book of Revelation. And once you realize that's what he's doing, and the related obsession that he has with the intimate relationship that exists between Christ, victor in the ordeal over Satan, and the church overcomers because of the blood of the Lamb, then you start to see it everywhere in his writings. Now, at the start of his sermon, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, it wouldn't have been cool to hear, more, uh, to hear Meredith Klein preach on the four horsemen of the apocalypse. But at the start of his sermon, he explained the outline of Revelation. This is what he said. The main outline of the apocalypse is quite simple. And as soon as you see what it is, you have the central message of the book as a whole. And you are already a long ways towards the correct understanding of the several parts. Let me give you that outline. The apocalypse opens with a picture of the church in this world, with Christ in a series of seven letters warning this church for its imperfections in life and doctrine, and comforting the church in the midst of its persecutions. But the apocalypse closes with a picture of the church in the world to come, and now it's a perfect and victorious church. Pivotal to the transformation of the church from imperfect in this world to perfect in heaven is Christ. I could have picked a number of places in Klein's writings 
for he details this, but listen to him from glory in our midst. He writes there, it is Christ, the son of man, who has decisively overcome the satanic dragon and has been established in supreme heavenly authority with cosmic dominion, who then proceeds to fashion the seven menorah churches, the true temple city, by his authoritative creative word through the power of the Spirit. See Revelation 2 and 3. At the climax of the apocalypse, the consummating of this holy architectural enterprise in the manifestation of the new Jerusalem, the glorified temple city, follows as the sequel to Christ's final judgment conquest of the dragon and his host, see Revelation 20, by which the son of David secured rest forever from all the enemies round about. Now Klein was deeply committed to the principle of recapitulation and interpreting the book of Revelation. But he didn't follow William Hendrickson's More Than Conquerors at every point. And there's a tip-off in Klein's student notes from Ned B. Stonehouse's Westminster class on Revelation that Stonehouse uh, influenced Klein in this direction. In the notes, Klein wrote, quote, Stoney thinks he forces the recapitulation a little. But where Stoney and Klein thought that Henderson forced the recapitulation was the division of chapter 17 through 22. Henderson's division was Revelation 17 through 19, the fall of the dragon's allies, and then Revelation 20 to 22, victory through Christ. What Klein argued for in his paper is that each time the phrase in the spirit appears in the book of Revelation, and that would be 110, 42, 17, 3, and 21, 9, each time in the spirit appears in Revelation, it starts a new section and presents a contrast. So in uh, the first appearance in 110 through chapter 3, the church is in the world. In 21.9 through 22.5, the church has been taken out of the world. The next appearance in 4.2. In 4.2 to 8.1, the church is in conflict with and overcome of the world. In 21.9 to 22.5, the church is at peace having overcome the world. In 17.3 to 21.8, the church apostate appears transformed into the world. In 21.9 to 22.5, the church glorified appears purified from the world. Now, there is some indication from Klein's uh, student notes that Stonehouse helped Klein see in the spirit as a marker, just as much as he helped Klein see that Hendrickson pushed the parallelism a little much. But in my judgment, what Klein does in the paper and what he does in his writings for the next 60 years is to take the understanding of Revelation to a deeper level. And as he did, he confirmed that the Reformed biblical theology of Faust, Klein, Gaffin was grounded hermeneutically just as much in the last book of the canon as it was grounded in the first book of the canon. Now, among the contributions uh, that Klein makes are these, and they're definitely not limited to these, but I would say th these are his major contributions from the book of Revelation. Klein sees how the eschatological goal set before Adam in the garden finds its fulfillment in the book of Revelation. Believers are overcomers because of the blood of the Lamb. But believers are also transformed into the image of God by the risen Christ and the Spirit. Writes Klein in Images, quote, the resurrection marked Christ's definitive assumption of his spirit identity. And in the vision of Revelation 1, John saw this risen, glorified Christ as the Spirit Lord, present to recreate all things, particularly to impart his glory to his church the new man created in his image. Namely, Christ appears, quote, 
as the one who came to his church in the spirit of Pentecost, standing as the spirit witness to the new covenant, as earlier he stood witness to the old covenant in the glory cloud at Sinai, and still earlier to the creation covenant in the glorious spirit of Genesis 1-2. So in the book of Revelation, Christ the Spirit Lord brings about for his church the covenant at hope at creation. Genesis 1-1 gives way to Revelation 21-1. The first heavens and new earth give way to the new heavens and new earth. Likewise, the not yet hospitable, deep and dark stage of Genesis 1-2 gives way to Revelation 21-1. In heaven there is peace and calm. In heaven there is no more sea. There's even an answer to the glory cloud in Genesis 1-2. The sending out of heaven in Revelation 21 and 22 is the new Jerusalem, the ultimate likeness of the spirit glory, a city transfigured in light, the light of the glory of God. Bright's climb, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ interprets to us the apocalypse of Elohim in Genesis 1 and clarifies our view of the Spirit as the theophonic glory, the divine archetype for the creation of man in the image of God. But then, Klein, if that again isn't enough, he then moves in images to show how revelation drives to the blessed reality that the church founded on Christ and the apostles will at last participate in the image of God in its consummated form. And again, he comes back to the importance of that phrase in the spirit. This time, however, showing how John uses it to describe the experience of being brought to the glory realm and having a foretaste of the eschatological perfecting of the image of God. In Revelation 1.10, John in the spirit stands in the presence of the glory embodied in the Son of Man. In Revelation 4.2, John, in the Spirit, answers an invitation to come up into heaven, where he sees God enthroned in the midst of unceasing praise of the heavenly host. In Revelation 17.3, John, in the Spirit, is escorted to the heavenly court to see a vision of Harlot Babylon, which is a foil for the closing vision in Revelation 21, where John, in the Spirit, is taken to the heavenly realms to see the church of the consummation. And what do we find there? The church in the consummation in Revelation 21 and following. We find there in the new Jerusalem that all of God's people are in the spirit. You want to be grounded in reformed biblical theology, which understands the connectedness of creation, covenant, and image. You could do worse than read Boss's Pauline Eschatology, Ritter Boss's Paul, Gaffin's Resurrection and Redemption, Tipton's Foundation of Covenant Theology, and then finish with Pine's Images of the Spirit. Secondly, in regard to his contributions, there is Klein's work on the structure of Revelation. So the first person I asked about the paper was Dick Gaffin. The second person I asked about the paper was Greg Beal. I asked him if he was aware of the paper. He told me, of course. He said, quote, Klein's thesis on the outbook of the, uh, outline of the book, of course, was the best I had ever seen. So I incorporated, incorporated that into my commentary. In his wonderful commentary on Revelation, Beale made public what Klein was sharing at Gordon Conwell with his students in his minor prophets class, a chiastic structure of the book of Revelation. Now, Klein was always working on the outline of the, the, the book of Revelation. There's multiple things, both published and not published, uh, concerning his outline. But in its most basic form, from his student paper on, this is how he saw the outline of Revelation and how it was a chiasm. So you have A, the introduction, which is chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. 
You have B, the church imperfect in the world, from 1-9 through the end of chapter 3. You have C, the seven seals, 4-1 through 8-1. You have D, the seven trumpets, that's 8-2 through the end of chapter 11. Then you have E, the centerpiece, the deeper conflict, that's chapters 12 through 14. Then you have D prime, the seven bulls, that's chapters 15 and 16. C prime, the final judgments, chapters 17, 1 through 21, 8. B prime, the church perfect in glory, 21, 9 through 22, 5. And then A prime, the conclusion, uh, chapter 22, 6 uh, to the end. Now, when you ever you have a chiasm, you always start at the center to determine the meaning. Listen to what Klein says in Glory in Our Midst. Quote, Revelation 12 to 14 occupies the center point of an overall seven-member chiasm. And here again, it is at the structural center that the depths of the redemptive historical process are explore, explored and exposed. This is how then, uh, Klein explained chapter 12, which he believes stands at the heart of the book of Revelation. And this is how he explains it in God, Heaven, and Armageddon. First, he exegetes the opening verses. He writes, Revelation 12 portrays the dramatic confrontation of Jesus and the devil, the decisive battle in the Armageddon warfare, as an unsuccessful attempt by the satanic dragon to devour the messianic child born to the glory-arrayed woman, Revelation 12, 1 through 5. Her male child, a son of man figure, emerges from the ordeal triumphant, destined to rule with an iron scepter over the nation, as prophesied in Psalm 2. Klein then moves to explaining Michael and Armageddon imagery. The battle is pictured again in Revelation 12, 7 and following, this time as a warring of Michael, the proper name of the messianic angel of the Lord, and his angelic legions against the dragon and his demonic hosts. The devil's defeat is depicted as a being hurled down to earth from his position in the invisible realm. The height from which Satan is said to be expelled is Revelation 12, 9, is the celestial mountain to whose lordship he was a pretender. It is Armageddon turned into a pseudo Armageddon in the fantasy world of Satan's ambitions and lies. And then finally, Klein explains how it relates to Christ, the church, and missions. The crushing of the serpent's head by the messianic seed of the woman is at the cost of the bruising of his heel. Hence, the gospel that is heralded to the ends of the earth after Satan's expulsion from on high is a message of Christ crucified, the lamb that was slain. Now again, Klein is Fossian. He sees eschatology preceding soteriology. He believes in the preeminence of God's glory in the consideration of all things, in the interpretation of, of Scripture, the preeminence of God's glory. But he is also Fossian because he believes that revelation is organic and progressive. And at the center of that revelation is Jesus Christ. So what does he do when he teaches about Genesis 3.15 and the promise uh, of the gospel? Uh, he, he goes to Revelation 12. Um, this, listen to what Charles Hill, who just retired after 30-some years at RTS Orlando, listen to what Charles Hill wrote Klein in 1985. Hill wrote, I remember listening to your lecture on Revelation 12 in the Pentateuch class and thinking, this is what I came to seminary for. You have helped provide me with a biblical theological framework for understanding of Scripture, which I know will guide my thought and study henceforth. So that's in his Pentateuch class. What does he do when he gets to his minor prophet class? He again focuses upon Revelation chapter 12. Zachariah's messianic servant is the child of Revelation 12 who conquers Satan so that believers might be stripped of their filthy garments and clothed in the righteousness of Christ. 
But as Klein makes clear in glory in our midst, you don't have to wait to Zechariah 3 to see that connection. Symbolically, the three main principles of Revelation 12 appear in Zechariah 1a. The rider on the red horse represents the glory presence of the Lord. The deep represents the satanic world. And the myrtles represent the covenant community. Zechariah 1a is where Klein explains the secret of the covenant. Voss explained the secret of the covenant from Psalm 25, 14. Klein explains the secret of the covenant in Zechariah 1, 8. What does Klein say the secret of the covenant is? It is that the Lord God is with his, com com is with his covenant community that finds itself by the satanic feet in this world. You see, in Zechariah 1, 8, the red rider is not by a ravine, as our English translations would have it. He's by the watery deep. Now, Klein, whose Hebrew skills were unmatched, it's hard to explain just how incredible he was in Hebrew, but you have to go back to his PhD. So he's at Dropsy College in Philadelphia, the preeminent Jewish ling linguistic school. He is studying under the most famous Jewish linguist of the first half of the 20th century, Cyrus Gordon. He has classes at Dropsy where it's just Cyrus Gordon, Klein, and Nahum Sarna, who has as good a claim to being the greatest Jewish linguist exegete of the second half of the 20th century. It's hard for us to get our minds around it, but the only thing I could think of is if you were at Princeton, seminary in the mid to late 1870s, and you were taking systematic thought theology of Charles Hodge. You were in the class, and the only other student in the class was B.B. Warfield. That's the equivalent. That's how good he was in Hebrew. I think, I think the case can be made, and I really think it's, 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 it's probably not even debatable. He's the greatest Gentile Hebraist of the 20th century. That's how good his Hebrew was. So he comes to Zechariah 1.8, and he reads the Hebrew. And he reads the Hebrew like he was taught at Dropsy. And he says, if we follow the Masoretic tradition for the vocalization of the noun in Zechariah 1.8, there is no reason to translate it as ravine or otherwise to depart from the regular meaning of Masula namely the depths of the sea, the watery deep. And friends, once you get that translation right, then you do see how Zechariah 1.8 speaks to the secret of the covenant. Then you see how it explodes upon the entirety of Scripture. So what does Klein do? Well, immediately he goes back to Genesis 3.14. There, Moses saw the theophonic fire identified with the angel of the Lord in the burning bush in the wilderness. Klein argues that what depicts the afflicted condition of the Israelites is not the fire in the bush, but the nature of the bush itself. It's a lowly desert shrub. Like the burning bush, a flame but not consumed by the presence of God, so the myrtles, which are a shrub, they're in the same shrub family. So the myrtles in Zechariah 1 are aflame with a divine glory, the red rider in their midst, but they are not consumed. So here is Klein. There's the protology, he takes you back. But then the secret of the covenant, he takes you forward. And he takes you forward to Revelation chapter 1. There, the glorified Christ stands among the seven lamps. The lamps are burning, renewed by the shining image of Christ, but they are not consumed. You see, this is what this, the whole story of Scripture is. This is the history of redemption. It's right there. But for Klein, he's still going to glean more from Zechariah chapter 1 in the, in the understanding of the apocalypse. So you have this happening in Zechariah 1.8. But then you have the agents of the angel writer. They report 
that all the earth is living quietly at rest. You see, rather than assisting the covenant people to recover from their captivity from Babylon, the at ease nations manifest defiant indifference to the covenant community. And having received this report, the divine angel is stirred up to pastoral intercession for the people of God and asks, how long? And Klein points then to the question that Christian martyr asked in Revelation 6.10, how long, O sovereign, holy and true, do you not judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And the answer in Revelation 6.11 is that they must wait until the number of martyr witnesses is filled up in the course of church history. And that brings us then to Klein's understanding of the millennium. The millennium symbolized in Revelation as a thousand years is the present church age of worldwide testimony in a gathering. It's the age of the Great Commission. The church advancing the gospel from Jerusalem to the nations. What the millennium is not is a period of political domination by the church. And here again, Klein is Bossian. Boss argues in his article, The Doctrine of the Covenant and Reformed Theology, that, quote, for the Reformed believer, Christianity, by virtue of its covenantal character, is a restless, recreating principle which never withdraws itself from the world, but seeks to conquer it for Christ. Only out of this consciousness of the covenant comes a true zeal for missions. For in missions, the body of Christ is striving towards its own completion, which it cannot reach as long as its members, all of its members, have not been added. So we have Klein's copy of Boss's shorter writings, and Klein was a, a marker. And in the margin to where that quote is, in Klein's copy, he writes, quote, to Boss, World conquest equals the Great Commission, not post-millennial kingdom. I think Klein is right in his reading of Boss, and he unmistakably shares Boss's views of an all-millennial understanding of the kingdom of God. But Klein also knows that the question then arises, what is meant in Revelation 20 regarding Satan's power as he is bound during the thousand years. Listen to Klein explain Satan being bound from his sermon, A Thousand Years in a Little Season. Quote, It is apparent here, as we have found elsewhere in Revelation, that the picture is symbolic and not, cannot be understood literally. How could a bodiless spirit such as Satan have an iron chain put on him? You would no more restrain Satan with a physical chain than you would hold back a cloud by lassoing, lassoing it with a rope. In what way did Christ combine the influence of Satan among men? In the sense that Satan should deceive the nations, i.e. the Gentiles, no more, until a long period, which is denoted by the symbolic number a thousand years, should elapse. So it isn't that, uh, it's not that Satan isn't active, he is. But what Revelation 20 tells us with the binding of Satan is that the nations no longer remain in ignorance outside the proclamation of the gospel. You see, in the Old Covenant, uh, Israel was the only nation in which the light of, the, of, of God shined. It was the only nation uh, that had the word of God. Now the gospel goes forth to the ends of the earth. Satan is bound. He cannot keep the gospel going forward to the nation's hearing. And of course, we cannot talk about Klein in the book of Revelation without talking about Armageddon. Klein argues convincingly that the place location of Armageddon in Revelation 16.16 16 is Mount Sinai. Most translators identify it as Megiddo, but there are so many problems with that translation. There's no mountain in Megiddo. 
Jerusalem is where prophecies situate the eschatological crisis in the Old Testament, where the, the nations gather against God and his people. There's textual evidence from Isaiah 14, 13, the Armageddon is a derivative of Har Moad, Mount of Assembly. In Revelation 22, the new Jerusalem of the new heavens and new earth is portrayed as a final consummating restoration of Eden. What we might miss, but what Ezekiel 28, 14 makes clear, is that both sides of God's throne are on a mountain. And the question is, who reigns on that mountain? From this textual evidence and more, Klein concluded that Armageddon, the Mount of Assembly from creation to consummation, provides an eschatological megastructure to the Bible. And the champion of Armageddon is Jesus Christ, the victor over Satan. So an all too brief summary of what we have addressed so far might be this. Klein believed that in the book of Revelation, Christ is transforming his church by his spirit into his image so that he might fellowship with believers forever in heaven. He is a, Christ is able to do this because he has won the victory over Satan in the great conflict of Armageddon, and in him, by his blood, the church also overcomes. But there's one more aspect that we have not yet covered in depth, which was so important to find. Until that time of dwelling with God in heaven, the church's purpose is to take the good news concerning Jesus Christ to the end of the earth. He was adamant that the church's purpose was missions, even if that means suffering and death. And this is why Revelation is so important to understanding uh, Meredith Klein and his theology. But it's also important in understanding his ecclesiology. It's from the understanding of Revelation 11 that one can start to glean why Meredith Klein sought out the OPC and supported the views of J. Gresson Machen and Cornelius Fantil his entire life, why he became involved in the Eritrean medical missions crisis and the uh, controversy in the OPC. And despite his deep frustrations at time, why he never left the OPC. Klein believed that there were those who owned God's covenant words and there were those who did not, even though they might confess that they belonged to Christ. Uh, now, this is not to say that, that Klein thought the OPC was the only true church but he did believe this. He passionately believed this. There must be a martyr church that embraces the testimony of Jesus and is willing to suffer and die in taking that, that word of Christ uh, to the ends of the earth. He saw this emphasized in Revelation 11, but even before he got there, he saw this emphasized in the introduction and conclusion to Revelation. Consider this from what Klein uh, puts together. Both the introduction and the conclusion, Revelation 1-2 and Revelation 22-9, both speak of the testimony of Jesus in a way that brings out the prophetic nature of the church's witness as that which must be in the likeness of Jesus' own witness. Both contain Beatitudes. Revelation 1-3 and 22-7, both contain Beatitudes about those who own God's covenant words, which in scripture brings into view covenant ratification. The faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the earth, Revelation 1.5, is the one in Revelation 22.20 who attests to the covenant vindication of the church. The church cries out, come Lord Jesus, and the faithful witness response as the Lord of the covenant and judge of the nations is, I come quickly. Both then have an amen. Revelation 1, 7 and 22, 20. Both have an amen, which is a faith subscription to a word of prophetic promise concerning the coming of Christ. But judgment awaits in Revelation 22, 18 and 19 for anyone who adds to the words of the prophecy of this book who does not utter an amen in faith. 
And here, Klein turned to Deuteronomy 29, 19, and 20. For there, if an Israelite hypocritically mouth the self-maledictory oath of the covenant, he might suppose his hypocrisy concealed in his own heart. But Yahweh, the avenging divine witness of the earth, sees all and judges all. The church who owns the covenant words of God cannot turn a blind eye to apostasy, which is what Meredith Klein believed had happened in the Presbyterian Church USA. In his sermon on Revelation 18, the Christian church apostate and true, Klein declares, quote, the church of Jesus Christ no longer thinks so severely of those who stray from scriptural teaching. Though men today proclaim heresies far worse than those for which the apostles use the vilest names of opprobrium, such men are not censured. In fact, in many denominations, they are voted to the highest honors. The worst of modernists, like Henry Sloan Coffin, is elected moderator of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church USA, not long after Jay Gresson Machen is thrown out. A great falling away from the truth, a great apostasy has taken place throughout Christendom. Klein believed that the developments in the Presbyterian Church were in line with the picture of apostasy found in the book of Revelation. He continues in the sermon. You recall how the first main section of Revelation depicts the church imperfect, partly good, partly bad. The good faithful remnant is seen suffering persecution from a hostile world until in the closing vision appears free from the attacking of its foes in triumphant in heaven. But in the course of the book, the unfaithful members of the church are also seen in their ungodly development until towards the close, we've seen their final, their final state. A church no longer making any show of being different from the world outside. Rather, the church outside has moved inside the apostate church. And thus, under the very banner of heaven, the world attacks the faithful remnant from within as well as from without. You see, Klein was keen to the fact that in Revelation, Babylon is a prostituted priesthood, an apostate church. Man as priest was to dedicate the world to God. Babylon, the apostate church, dedicates itself to the world. But Revelation 18 makes clear the day of reckoning is coming for Harlot Babylon. And Revelation 21 and 22 make clear that once the day of terror is past, those who have overcome by the blood of Christ will enter eternal rest. But until that time, the message of the book of Revelation is that the church's purpose is missions. Listen to Klein's passion for missions from his sermon on Revelation 11, the testimony of Jesus tried and true. This is what Klein declared. If the Orthodox Presbyterian Church were not eager to spend itself in missionary advancement, it would not be true to Christ. Because it is, you are called upon to sacrifice and labor. You are entitled to the inspiration of a God-given vision of the work for which you are asked to sacrifice. Such a vision is given us in Revelation chapter 11. See, in Revelation chapter 11, uh, you find that the time is coming when God will permit the Satan-driven world to overcome the church. The so two witnesses in Revelation 11 will lie dead. But that time will not come until the church has completely finished its God's appointed task of witness. But as Klein points out, when the world kills the two witnesses, the world robs itself forever of the opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and to be saved. This is what Klein declared. For when the missionary work of the church comes to an end, God's chief design of human history comes to an end. 
you might never get that impression from the history books or the newspapers or even the lives of Christians. The whole point of this world's continuing existence and continuing history is that God might, through the missionary efforts of the Christian church, gather in the remainder of his elect from the nations of the earth. That's the whole point of your life and mine. If it were not for that purpose, there would be no point in God's leaving us in this world a moment longer. And he would remove us at once from the miseries and sin of this earth into the perfect and abundant life of heaven, which Christ has purchased for us. How this thought ought to set our hearts on fire to serve Christ with all that we have and to finish the great task of world evangelization. Now, understanding Revelation 11 correctly was why Klein was so passionate that the OPC should focus on the preached word in mission. It was not against, it was not that he was against helping others. Klein believed that Christians as individuals can sponsor hospitals, but it is only the church that has the calling in scripture to preach the word. In Klein's judgment, for the church to lose sight of that calling lessens what should be its passion in evangelism and introduces a mix of church, state, and private institutions that is problematic. Um, as we heard earlier today from John Meather's talk, Klein lost that battle in the OPC at the General Assembly level in 1963 and in the process was ripped to shreds in Christianity today. In an editorial, The Church and the Mission Hospital, C.T. argued that Klein supported neglecting good works on the mission field for fear of exposure to the social gospel. Herbert Byrd, OPC missionary to Eritrea where the hospital was being built, came to Klein's defense in the full letter to the editor, which only a portion was printed, Klein argued that Christianity Today had printed, quote, a most lamentable distortion of my good friend and ministerial colleague, Dr. Meredith G. Klein. According to Byrd, the narrow issue was whether the church as church had biblical warrant to administer the affairs of a medical establishment. Klein believed that such work should be carried out but he believed that it should be done by private associations of believers. Well, later that year, Klein accepted an invitation to teach Old Testament Gordon Conwell. Uh, what uh, is important to understand here uh, is not only that Klein had the opportunity uh, to teach classes that he wanted, but the OPC had just planted a church there. There was not an OPC congregation locally there in 1958 when he turned down the first invitation. But in 1964, the OPC had just planted a church there by Wendell Rocky First Church at, at Ipswich. And uh, so the return to Gordon allowed Klein not only uh, greater teaching freedom, it allowed him an opportunity to be involved in a local OPC church, but it also allowed him to have family nearby in regard uh, to his growing family, and that was also uh, important. Klein was very active in First Church Ipswich and the Deer Wanderer Bible Conference for decades, but he was no longer active in the courts of the church. And um, I lo uh, lament his inactivity at the presbytery level particularly. But that's not to say that he took the church and missions less seriously. Quite revealing uh, is a letter that Klein received in the mid-1990s from a student that he had taught at Westminster in the early 1950s. The student, um, the individual, had a long list of grievances against the OPC and had abandoned church altogether. Klein replied that there were things about the OPC that discouraged him terribly. And he listed them, and uh, he, again, was distraught about what he called the wooden traditionalists. Uh, but then he added, quote, I won't harangue you about the importance of maintaining expression 
of the institutional church that is concerned to maintain the integrity of a reformed confessional witness. For the sense of responsibility along those lines is why I remain in the OPC in spite of all that turns me off. When I read uh, Meredith Klein on the book of Revelation, that sense of the integrity of a Reformed confessional witness comes through in his exegesis. An exegesis that shows that Christ, risen and glorious, is transforming his church by his spirit into his image so that he might fellowship with his bride forever in heaven. And the purpose of the church until that glorious day in fullness above is to passionately and without end take the gospel of Christ and him crucified to the ends of the earth. Thank you. Well, we hope you enjoyed the lecture. Uh, Danny certainly brought uh, much learning and research in an engaging way to the table. We really appreciate his contribution there. Uh, if you'd like to listen to any of the other lectures slash addresses from this recent conference, you can find them on YouTube at youtube.com slash reformed forum. You can also head over to reformedforum.org slash conference for the time being, if you're clicking on that soon, if, if uh, that link doesn't work for you anymore, then uh, just go to the events section of our menu uh, because eventually this that link, that URL is going to point to a new event. But you can head over and find the 2022 Theology Conference in the menu and uh, click on it. And you'll find links uh, to all of the addresses to the YouTube page, the YouTube videos for each one. Um, if you'd like to, to follow up with any of these ideas or if you have any questions, one way to get a hold of us is through the contact form on the website where you can also email us directly at mail at reformedforum.org or tweet us at reformedforum. And we love your suggestions. Uh, we're going to be scheduling more podcasts coming down the road. We're also looking at doing um, mini events and conferences and things online using AirMeet, our new online platform. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of excitement, ways that we can connect with you. Finally, I should mention uh, that you can help support our work here at Reformed Forum by visiting, uh, visiting our donate page, reformedforum.org slash donate. And there you can pledge your support. We, we, uh, we're in need. We certainly could use uh, the help and the assistance to uh, continue delivering, and not only delivering, but producing all of these Reformed resources and distributing them free of charge. Uh, we have a lot on our plate. We have a lot going on, a lot of exciting work before us and we have a really wonderful and solid team of people working uh, alongside of me uh, me myself uh, of course ryan noah and we have uh, three other uh, wonderful folks that are working to uh, carry out the labors of reformed forum uh, but we need your help so help us uh, to meet our budget to uh, make us help us to finish the year strong and to go into 2023 even stronger by heading over to reformedforum.org slash donate. And if you have any questions, please contact us. We'd be happy to talk to you. But I do want to thank everybody for listening, and we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center. <laughs>